for a blessing on the other side of the Lord, you are going to come on. Just ask the Lord to be with them, be beside them. Father, lift them up, God, give them courage. Because we know, Father, there's some Christians in that country. All abroad, all around the world, where missionaries are, Lord, the gospel goes out. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for that. Be with our missionaries. Lord, if they're having problems, God, then help them. Come alongside them and help us, Lord, to help them. Uh, by sending things to them, uh, where they need money, where they need uh, money that they can get food from. But Lord, we know that you're the God of the earth, you're the God of heaven. And Father, nothing passes you that you don't know about. And Father, we're just thankful, Lord, for God that is almighty in knowledge, almighty in love, almighty in truth. And Father, you are the one who forgives sin. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Lord, that you come through us. And our need and our prayer. And know, Lord, that you're going to hear us and provide. We just thank you, Lord, for a country that we can live in. Where we have the abundance of these things. And Lord, just help us, Lord, not to take it for granted, but to pray for each and every individual, Lord, that's in our community, that's in our state, Lord, that is outside the states and other states. We just ask God, Lord, that you bless our leaders. Lord, come alongside them. Help our president. Lord, give him wisdom. Give the man in Congress wisdom. Able to do those things, Father, that they can. To provide for the ones who can't provide for themselves. We just thank you, Father, for our positions that we have all around the world. God, they're able to take care of people and help people. Make people better. But, Father, you're the great healer. And it's all done because of you. We just thank you, Lord. And may we not forget to praise you. For all the comfort, Lord, that you give to us. And Lord, the, the very truth, the gospel that we can help share across the world. Help us, Lord, not to forget that. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, to have a loving God. Continue, Lord, to bless our country, bless our leaders, and help us, Father, to be more like you, to share our love. And Lord, to, to help one another. We thank you, God. And we praise you for all things, for medicine, for physicians, and everything that you have, you give it to us freely. That we may have those things, Lord, because you love us and you bless us. We thank you, Lord. And as I ask, Lord, you continue, we continue in prayer. Bless our pastor, bless this church, bless those who are here, those who couldn't be here. And Lord, if they're sick, we just pray, Father, you come alongside them, help them, encourage them. And Lord, just help us, Lord, to be an encouragement. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Some of the I'm going to call it. I want to come to you now and thank you for your love and your kindness and your mercy. Thank you for the people here at Open Door Baptist Church that we can assemble and meet and listen and pray to your name. Lord, I pray for our country that we can go back to Chronicles and humble ourselves and turn to you turn from the wickedness of, of sin. Lord, help us always seek your face first. Build a hedge around the people here at this church to where we can always be a shining light for people up and down, state and our road and in our community. Lord, if we see a need, help us to have the wisdom and the insight from you to reach out with love and compassion as you reached out when you sent Jesus, your son, to die for us. Lord, let us not fear anything that's coming from all this coronavirus, but let us be a work that only you can fix and you can shine a light on to make people see in your face. Lord, I pray for Pastor David that as he brings the message today that it'll be something that'll pride our hearts and our minds and that we can go throughout this week and fulfill the message of your word. This is my prayer in your son's most precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Well, today's a special day. Amen. Brother Eric has been attending our church for about seven or eight months now, uh, since the last summer. Uh, and uh, he's uh, come now to be baptized and to join our church. Amen. And uh, he's gone through the starting points and we learned a lot and enjoyed that spending time together uh, in that in that class, that discipleship class. And, uh, and so 
He's come to be baptized formally uh, through immersion in the church. Uh, so, uh, Parent, I just need to ask, have you repented and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. He shared about a year ago is when he put his faith and trust in Christ. And uh, just hearing his testimony, it's amazing. The way that Christ has changed his life is just so encouraging. His heart to be here, and uh, we're excited to have him join the membership. And get plugged in and uh, learn and grow here. We're so thankful for that. So I'm going to have you cover your nose. And I'm going to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Bear in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. with my soul. I thought that would be appropriate with what's just going on in our world. So let's stand together and uh, let's sing It Is Well With My Soul.
more. Amen. We're not going to shake hands, so just keep saying it. Shake them like this.
to be that light to this world uh, that is lost and dying and is just overwhelmed by what's going on, the uncertainty. And Lord, may we share the certainty of life with you, with them, as we try to practically show love and care to them. What I pray now as we transition into our message and, uh, and even uh, take the time to, very, in a very cautious, cautious way, partake the Lord's table, uh, Lord, I think this is an, an appropriate time for us to reflect on your death uh, and your life and your life and your death and your resurrection. So I pray that we come with it, come to it with sobriety. May we rejoice in what you purchased for us, uh, and may we then walk out these doors into the mission field that is our neighborhood, that is the Kroger, that is our, our place of employment, and may we share the love of Christ with them. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, take your Bible this morning, your copy of God's Word, to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and uh, we will be partaking of the Lord's table at the end, and uh, we've been very cautious. Uh, the juice is in a cup, and so, I believe, is the bread, and so it's not getting grimy hands in it. And so we're going to be, be very cautious, but uh, especially with this morning not being canceled, I felt like it would be appropriate for us to continue uh, with, uh, with what we had planned. So John chapter 1. John's Gospel in verse number 29. Uh, we're just going to read that one verse uh, and then jump into uh, the message. It helps if I hear myself. John chapter 1 and verse number 29. The scripture writes, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and say, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. There may not be a, a more appropriate message to share, not just with Lord's table, but with what's going on in our world, that there is a Lamb of God who will take away sin, uh, and even in the midst of sin suffering, like COVID, there is freedom and forgiveness from sin. And so John here is declaring, he is proclaiming that Christ is the Lamb of God, the one to be the fully sufficient sacrifice for sin, the one and the only that can satisfy God's demands for our sin. So today as we reflect on the Lord's table, I want us to really just look at this one verse and reflect on the various elements of John's God-given and God-ordained statement about Jesus Christ. And so let's begin with it. Behold. The word behold is an interjection. It is a word used to describe emphatic emotion. For you and I, it would be like, hey, look, really loud, behold. I want us to imagine just for a moment, many of you were in Sunday school uh, as children, and you learned about John the Baptist, and he was this fiery-eyed, crazy preacher, eating, you know, locusts and honey and wearing camel skin, right? He is, he is a, a, a ball of emotion 
uh, and fire. And you see him preaching and teaching in the wilderness. And all of a sudden, he's in the middle of, middle of, of a sentence. And he's preaching, the kingdom of heaven is a hand, repent and believe. And he suddenly stops in the middle of a sentence and points his finger and says, Behold! Behold! Boy, that kept your attention, wasn't it? I mean, you're, you're riveted on him. He's a fiery preacher. And all of a sudden, he stops and says, Look, pay attention. See here. Watch who this is. John is emphatically, unapologetically, and I would say even humbly calling all of those who are flocking to hear him to turn their gaze and focus upon Jesus. The one who was prefer, preferred before him, he said. The one who he said he was unworthy in verse number 27 to even unloose his sandal. John would continue the statement in verse 30. He must increase, I must decrease. So he's unapologetically, emphatically, but humbly saying, don't look at me, look to him. And today at the Lord's table, we too are called to behold, to look upon and to pay attention to and gaze upon the person and work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, as we partake at the Lord's table, and as we think about what just, what's going on in our world, I want us to stop and behold. I want us to, in wonder and reverence, and in gratitude, behold and view the person and work of Jesus Christ as the sufficient, fully sufficient sacrifice for sin. There is nothing else that can provide you forgiveness and restoration with God. Right. There's nothing else. And there is nothing else that can provide hope and certainty in a life of uncertainty other than a restored relationship with God in Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to look at this statement and see exactly what John is trying to get across to his audience. Number one, I want you to notice that John powerfully calls attention to who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. He uses the word lamb. The Greek word is amnos. It's only seen four times in the New Testament, and twice are in this chapter, and John uses it. The other two times are in Acts 8.32 and 1 Peter 1. Each time, all four times this word is used, it's used to refer to Christ and his sacrificial work. In Acts chapter 8, verse 32, it implies the suffering servant who would die as a sacrificial lamb. Uh, Philip is quoted in Isaiah 53, and he says that he was led as a sheep to the shearer, to, as a lamb, uh, be dumb before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth. Obviously referring to Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 8, Peter says that, that Christ's blood, his precious blood, is like a lamb without spot or blemish. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition... But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so when John says that he is the lamb, it refers to the sacrifice of God on our behalf. He says the lamb of God. Now those English nerds, we know that that's a preposition of, right? Of God. A preposition uh, tells us two things. It either tells us origin or derivation or source. It either tells us where it came from or what it's made of. Okay, that's the idea. That's what a preposition does. So, when John says that Jesus is the Lamb of God, it tells us two things. Number one, John tells us that he is the Lamb from God. Meaning God is the origin of this Lamb. Put it this way. Jesus is the Lamb from God himself. God is the origin of it. It is from God to sinful humanity. It is a sacrifice of love from God to you and I. In a great typological picture, we see this truth played out in, in a beautiful narrative with Abraham and Isaac on their way up to Mount Moriah in Genesis 22. Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. Remember, God told him to sacrifice his son. But where is the lamb, Isaac says? Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? We have everything we need except for the offering. And notice what Abraham says in verse number 8. In a, a moment of great faith, he says this, My son, 
God will provide himself a lamb for the offering. Okay? God is the lamb. Jesus is the lamb from God himself. What a great picture that Jesus is the sacrifice from God for you and I. But not only is he the lamb from God, John is also telling us that this lamb is God. God is the source of this lamb. Jesus himself is the lamb of God. The lamb is not just from God. The lamb is God. The lamb is not simply from God, but he is God incarnate, dwelling amongst men. John 1 tells us this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh, human body, and he dwelt among us. John says that we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, meaning he's God, full of grace and truth. John himself would affirm this later on in this chapter when he said, I knew him not, but he sent me to baptize with water, and the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, the same is he which baptizes in the Holy Ghost, and I saw and I have record that this is the Son of God. Okay, let me give you background, okay, real quick. That's John saying, hey, this is, this is, the, this is God. Well, why did he say that? Well, because when John baptized Jesus, what took place? Okay. The Father spoke from heaven. The, the dove came down to represent the Spirit. And they said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So this wasn't just the Lamb from God. It literally was God. So when John uses this title, Lamb of God, what does he have in mind? Yes, it's from God. Yes, he is God. But I think there are four pictures that may contribute to this picture of the Lamb of God. I just want to go through these briefly. First of all, John may have been thinking about the Passover Lamb. The Passover is not too far off. In verse number 13 of chapter 2, we go into the Passover. So the Passover is just moments away. In Exodus 12, we see the account of the first Passover. The blood of spotless lambs are put on the doorpost to save the lives of believing Israelites that night in Egypt. The blood of the lambs were placed upon the doorpost, and it delivered them from the death angel. It could be that John was stating this. Just as the blood of that Passover lamb delivered your fathers, here comes the true lamb. Right. The one sacrifice to deliver you from sin and death. This is the true lamb. Paul also defined Jesus as the true Passover lamb in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, where he said, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So the Passover lamb to cover our sins so that we could be passed over. But also we need to consider the fact that John was the son of a priest. So he would be very familiar with the rituals of the temple. Every morning and evening a lamb would be sacrificed for the sins of the people. John would be aware of that. And as long as the temple stood, those sacrifices every morning and every night were made. It may have been that John is saying, in the temple, a lamb is offered every morning and evening for your sins. But in Jesus, look at him. He's the only sacrifice that can deliver men and women from sin for all of eternity. Look to him. He's better than the sacrifices in the temple. It could be that he's referring to the sacrificial lamb foretold by the prophets. Jeremiah wrote of a lamb brought to the slaughter, Jeremiah 11, 19. Isaiah spoke of it in Isaiah 53, verse 7. Both of these prophets and others had a great vision of one who would suffer and would sacrifice his life to redeem his people. Could John be saying, your prophets dreamed of one who was to love and suffer and die for his people? That one has come. Look at him. He's right there. Also, finally, it could be the warrior lamb seen in Jewish writings. Now, we're, we're probably a little more unfamiliar with this. Uh, in Jewish literary culture, a horned lamb stood as a champion of God. It was used to describe men in the Old Testament, like Samuel the prophet, uh, King David, King Solomon. Uh, and even Judas Maccabeus of the intertestamental period, or in silent years, he was viewed as a horned lamb. This is a unique picture that we see in the book of Revelation, as Christ is described as a triumphant lamb with horns. John may be referencing a picture of the conquering majesty and power that is in Jesus Christ, the champion of God who would fight against sin and have complete mastery over it. So these are four potential pictures, and, and while we not, may not fully understand John's intent, 
we as believers with the full scripture in front of us can see that in its truest and fullest sense, the Lamb of God is a title for Jesus Christ alone. Amen. It's especially understanding him as the one sacrifice for you and I. So this statement's on the screen. Considering these four, four pictures, we understand this morning that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Jesus is the fulfillment of the temple sacrifices as one final, complete sacrifice for sin. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophetic sufferings of the Messiah. And Jesus is and will reign as conquering and king. Amen. He's all of those things. He's all of that. He's all of that and more. I'm considering this title, one author wrote this. In one word, it sums up the love, the sacrifice, and the suffering, and the triumph of Jesus Christ. It's all of it. This title sums up it all. That's who he is. He is the Lamb of God. He is God himself, and he is from God himself. That's who he is, but I want us to notice, secondly, what John declares Jesus will do. Behold, the Lamb of God, verse 29, which taketh away the sin of the world. Which taketh away. The word taketh away there means to remove something concrete. To pick it up. To push it or take it off. To remove something. It's, it, it's as if I were to take this flower and I would take it away out of the room. That's the picture. That he's taking something concrete and real and he is removing it from a place. This taking away has a twofold meaning. First of all, it means that Jesus, this Lamb of God, takes up sin. He takes it up means he makes it his own. He becomes chargeable with the guilt and punishment right. for our sin. Right. He takes it upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin. That's the picture. He became it. He bore in his body the marks of our sin. So he takes it up, and he stands before God, his Father, rightfully condemned for our sin. But not only does he take it up and become chargeable with it, he takes it away. He doesn't just hold on to it. He then takes it away. He bears away the guilt and punishment of our sins. The enmity, Paul would say, is slain thereby. It's destroyed. The guilt and the punishment is gone because he took it upon himself. So he takes away sin. Okay, sin is sin. Sinfulness. It, it implies the guilt of sin. It's the state of breaking God's law. And now you're liable to the legal consequences. It's not difficult. When we break the law and we run through that red light, if anybody does that, you're liable to the consequences of that. You are guilty of that. Sin is no different. You have broken. You and I have broken God's law. And God is a just, righteous judge. The only right thing for him to do is to judge and condemn the sin. And yet... The Lamb of God comes to take it away. Now what's interesting about this phrase, the sin, is that it's a singular number. You ever wonder why he doesn't say the sins of the world? Plural? John says the sin of the world. What it marks, and you see it on the screen, it's not like this sin and you know you lied and you cheated and you were angry and you know, it's, it's not like this religion. It is a collective burden of all of man's sin and guilt. And it's not just all of our sin. It is the all-embracing procurement of Christ's sacrifice for all of that sin. In, that, in essence, John's saying it's enough for all people. Yeah. It's not just sin. It's like my sins. It is sin altogether. It is all sin collectively. The Lamb of God is able to take away, to take up, and to remove all sin. It's not just my sin of cheating and my sin of lying. It's all sin. This phrase is evocative. This phrase of taking away sin of the scapegoat ritual in Leviticus 16. We won't go there, but in Leviticus 16, on the Day of Atonement, they would have two lambs. They would kill one on the altar and, and have the sacrifice, but then they would take one and let it out into the wilderness. And it would it picture the two fold meaning here. He would take up sin, the sacrifice of that lamb, and then the other goat lamb would take that sin out of the camp. 
That's the picture here, Leviticus 16. That Jesus would bear in his body and be slain for our sin, but also he would remove it from us. He would remove it from us. Prophesied of Christ, Isaiah spoke vividly of this. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. 1 Corinthians 5.41 For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us that knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, one of my favorite songs uh, is entitled My Sin. And it says this, My sin has been nailed to the cross of my Savior, for he has taken my sin and he has nailed it to his cross. Amen. That's what took place here. Trying to grasp the statement that our sin was taken away, one author said this, Without any exception, every kind of evil and sin is covered. There is no sin too heinous, no wickedness too terrible, no habitual failure too often repeated, that it cannot be taken away by Christ or heavenly Lamb. I'm going to read that again. There should have been an amen there. <laughs> Without any exception, that means no matter what you've done, every kind of sin and evil is covered. There is no sin too heinous, no wickedness too terrible, no habitual failure too often repeated, that it cannot be taken away by Christ our heavenly Lamb. Amen. This morning, that means you and I, if we place our faith in Christ, are forgiven of it all. That means this morning, if you have not repented and put your faith and trust in Christ, you know what that means? It doesn't matter what you've done, you can find forgiveness in Christ. Amen. Because he is the Lamb that takes away all sin. He takes away all of your sin. As a believer, there is nothing you've done, will do, or even can do that can take, that will remove, or that is not taken up and taken away by the Lamb of God. There's no guilt in life. There's no fear in death because of the power of Christ the Lamb. Amen. And that's the hope that we ought to show the world right now. Because there's a bunch of fear. There's a bunch of worry in this life. But because of the Lamb of God, we've been forgiven. We can provide hope to a world because of what Christ the Lamb has done. Because he has taken away our sins and he's nailed it to his cross and they've forever been written off. Christ sees Christ's righteousness on our account. So he is the Lamb of God. So God himself, God himself, which takes away the sin. But I want you to notice finally, John affirms the scope how far will it go what Jesus did, does? The scope of what Jesus will do. And he says this in verse number 29. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The word world here is cosmos. We got a cosmopolitan, cosmetology from this word. Cosmos here refers to the world populace. Uh, it is people in general as a whole. It's all people includes both Jew and Gentile alike. John says that this Lamb of God can remove and take away sin of the whole world. That his sacrifice is enough to forgive all people. God's love leads him to give his only son for that world, you and I, so that all who believe might have eternal life. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. So Jesus' heart, God's heart, is for the world. His sacrifice is enough for all people. Amen. He has brought the ability for all to put faith in Christ. He has provided for all. He's provided for all. We must make the choice to accept it by faith. And he has provided for all. In John chapter 4, we see that the Samaritans came to recognize that Jesus is really the Savior of the world and not just Jewish full-blooded people. In John 4, the, the Samaritans say this, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. They said, hey, we believe that he is the Savior of the world, not because of what you said, Samaritan woman, but because we heard him and saw him ourselves. He is the Savior of not just the Jews, but of the world. There is no distinction. There is no prejudice in whose sin the Lamb can take away. There's simply an exception. 
must receive it by faith. Christ's sacrifice on the cross is more than enough to forgive you, more than enough to restore you, more than enough to declare you righteous, more than enough to bring you freedom. But you must receive it by faith. John 1 tells us this. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came to his own people, and they didn't have the faith to believe him. They rejected him. But verse 12 tells us this. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Why or how? Even to them that believe on his name. Belief is the key. To say, I'm not going to trust in that anymore. I'm going to turn and trust in him. And his sacrifice is enough for all sin. All of your sin can be forgiven, taken away in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Amen. But it must be received by faith. It must be received by faith. <laughs> this morning, if you are here and you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you have not turned from sin and looked to Jesus Christ as that lamb, I encourage you to do so this morning. Amen. We're in a time of confusion and crisis in our country. The one person I know who can provide hope is Jesus Christ. Amen. He promises to never leave us or forsake us, those who are his children. He promises to, promises to give us his spirit in us, to comfort us and give us love and grace. It's all available in Jesus Christ, but we must put our faith and trust in him. We must believe on his name. We must admit and understand that we're a sinner and we're condemned before God. We must believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, that he died and was buried and rose again for our sins, and that we must confess it. We must repent and trust in him alone. Amen. That he is the only way. I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me, Jesus right. said. Amen. He is the door in John chapter 6. Yeah. He is the bread of life. No, every man may come to him and be fulfilled with the bread that is eternal. It's available to all because it's available to the whole world. So this morning, as we partake of the elements of the Lord's table, let us emphatically, but humbly behold and remember the Lamb of God that has taken away the sin, our sin, because of our faith in him. But not only our sin, but the sin of all who would put their faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Let us rejoice. Let us behold him this morning as we partake. But let us remember that there's a lost and dying world who needs that same message. That needs the Lamb of God to take away their sin. And he's able to. All it takes is repentance and faith. To turn to Christ alone. By faith alone. In his grace alone. And we can find forgiveness and freedom. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I pray as we transition into a time of partaking of the elements, I pray that you would help us to remember what you did for us. Lord, I pray that you would challenge us to share that message with the world around us. Especially now, I pray that you would help us to go to neighbors, co-workers, someone that we know is struggling with sickness or illness or are susceptible to COVID. I pray that you would help us to show the love of that land. Once again. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. And I'm going to ask Greg and, and Tom to come and uh, with the Lord and help us get uh, our elements together. And then put the, the top back on for her. That'd be wonderful. As they're setting up, I just want to ask a simple question. If you're here this morning and you know that the Lamb of God has taken away your sin, you know, not because of an experience or a, a day, but you know from a Bible reason that I have placed my faith in Jesus Christ, and you know for a fact that you are a child of God, the Lamb of God has taken away your sin, would you be willing to raise your hand and say, I 
know that my sin has been taken away by the Lamb of God. Would you raise your hand? You put your hand up and say, I know that my sin has been taken away. Amen. Thank you for those who are honest and maybe didn't raise your hand. My next question is for you. I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to, I'm not going to call you out by name. No one else is looking. I just want to, to ask. If you would say, Pastor David, I know that the Lamb of God has not taken away my sin. Or I'm not sure that Jesus Christ is my Savior. That he has forgiven me of my sin. I, I stand right before God. I know I'm not, or I don't know if I am. Would you be willing just to simply, no one else is looking, simply raise your hand so that I can pray for you. I won't call you up by name. But you'd say, I don't know, or I know that I am not forgiven. I know that the Lamb of God has not taken away my sin because I haven't put my faith in him. If that's you, when you do one, just raise your hand so I can pray for you. I'm not going to call you up by name. I simply want to pray for you. If that's you this morning, and you say, I don't know, or I know that I'm not, and would you pray for me, would you raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you this morning if that's you. Let's go to the room and pray. Father, thank you that we are in the midst of many believers who have put their trust in you. And you've changed their lives. I'm thankful for my brother Eric who testified to me of how you've changed his life and he came to be baptized to identify with you this morning. And Lord, I pray for those who, in a moment of honesty, weren't able to raise their hand, and yet maybe are still struggling in their spirit about who Jesus is, what he accomplished, why do I need Jesus, what is sin. Lord, I pray that you give them boldness to come to speak to uh, one of the leaders in the church. We'd be happy to sit down and talk to them. I pray that your spirit would continue to convict and just guide them to truth as they search. And Lord, I pray for our world, our community, our city, our country, and our world as they go through the, the dark time of the fear and the anxiety of this coronavirus. Lord, I pray that they would see hope in Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're going to end with our, our time of communion. Uh, and so we're going to begin uh, by having the men distribute uh, the bread. And then we'll read some scripture and partake of that together. Uh, and then we'll distribute the juice. So, John, go ahead and start singing. And men, start with the bread. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life. My strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, when through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of fear, when fears are Verse 19, Jesus said this, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread. Now distribute the juice.